All right, we're getting close to the end. Um, today's lecture is a big lecture. It is method of sections of beams, and there are principles you we are going to go through in this that you're going to continue to do all the way throughout um, second term, which you guys are going to have a big gap until you hit. So we're going to be doing that next year at this time as well. Um, we're going to start by doing a little intro to the type or a reminder of the types of forces, um, and we're going to look at. Uh, how we did our truss analysis and how really what I'm about to show you is the exact same thing. It's just a slightly uh, different way of presenting it. Um, I wanted to point out that I am getting a few questions about uh, project part two. Um, next week we're going to look at moment frames and deflection criteria, uh, but we're also going to do a few examples. So we're going to work through uh, a column example, and we're going to work through a few beam examples, um, meaning that most of the questions I've been getting will be answered next week. Um, a lot of the other things you, you can't do yet are coming out of this lecture. Um, so some of those questions I'm not going to answer until after next week. If you still have some questions, the TAs and I are more than happy to answer them, but I think this week and next week will really add a lot of clarity um, to what you're trying to understand. So, uh, bear with it. You, there's, um, there's still two weeks left of, of learning. So, we're going to get to the end of it. Um, and after this week, you're going to find that you, you have made great progress in your understanding. I know last week's assignment is a hard one. People always struggle with that one. Um, it's also the one that when the accreditation committee shows up, it's the very first one they look at. That's the thing they want to see. Did you do trusses, method of sections? Um, they are heavily invested in that one. So we can show proof that every year we do that really hard assignment with those really hard problems. I can promise you that any trust question on the exam will be much, much, much simpler than that. Think five members total. Um, and I wouldn't make you solve for all the members because let's face it, Quarkus trying to get anything out of it is a pain. Um, so you would be asked maybe for a specific element and maybe some general questions about the rest of the truss. Remembering that we have, let me grab my, my phone block, that if this, looks like a truss, when we bend something with a load pointing downwards, the top or the top cord is in compression and the bottom or the bottom cord is in tension. Um, so it won't be that hard in the exam, um, but we had to go through it and we had to take a look at all of those hard complicated ones. So let's dig into this week, which is taking everything we learned last week for method of sections with trusses, which really kept all the members in axial loading. This week, we need to talk about what happens if we don't have a series of struts and webs in this object and we have bending in it. How does the load that was applied right here get over to those reactions that we know we can solve for? And so how can we figure out what the internal loads are in the rest of that member? So internal forces are forces that act internally on an object that cause no movement on the subject in space, but they can cause distortion. So our object is bending. There is distortion, but that is not movement. These are the movements we're talking about. There is no movement. It's not going up and down. It's not sliding back and forth, and it's not spinning in space. But there is distortion. They are typically pairs of forces or pairs of moments, which include an applied force and a reaction to hold it in equilibrium. So we have um, uh, forces and reactions that are holding this in equilibrium, but somehow that applied force has to get over here to our reaction. Last week, we looked at axial loads in uh, objects that transferred that load over to the reactions. But we know that there's shear and bending that can occur as well, especially in a bending element. So that's what we're going to look at this week. 
Now, just a refresher, axial loads, compression, tension. So we're squashing, we're pulling. Shear is the one that tends to mess everyone up, but we're talking about what's happening along a singular plane in our object. So if we're pushing down on one side and pulling up on the other, what is happening at that interface? But if we have a load pushing down here and a reaction pushing up here, we want to know what's happening at this plane, and we want to know what's happening at this plane, and we want to know what's happening at this plane, and this plane, and this plane, and this plane, and a ridiculous amount of very small planes side by side. We want to know what's happening at every step along the way. So a force acting in a direction parallel to a surface or to another planar cross-section of a body. So this is similar to a couple, but with a moment arm of zero, meaning that we've got one force going up and one force going down, but the distance between them is zero. If there was a distance between them, we'd have a moment. Well, what if we looked at this plane and then right beside it this plane and what at this, this plane right beside it, but then we went back and looked at this plane and this plane, we've also got moment. So shear, we're talking about that slip right along one plane. Bending, a force that acts to bend a component, putting one side of the part in tension and the opposite side in compression. It's the same as tension and compression couples. So we'll often rewrite it as two forces pushing in, causing tension, and two forces pulling out, causing compression. Yeah, wait, no, this is, yeah, two, sorry, two forces pushing in causing compression and two forces pulling out causing tension. Remember our internal uh, uh, forces that we would draw? So if we were looking at, say, uh, a cut right here, if it's pushing in, it's compression. If it's pulling out, it's tension. And remember in our trusses, we always drew everything acting away from the cut, meaning we always assumed it was in tension. And that way, if we got a negative number, we knew it was in compression. And when we analyzed our trusses, for the most part, for a basic one that was bending like this, we had a top cord in compression and a bottom cord in tension. Torsion, which is one we're not going to worry about in this course, but it's a force that twists an object due to an applied torque. It's similar to a pair of couples on the same axes. So you could look at it like this. <clears throat> they're, they're both acting in equal and opposite directions, um, but they're causing it to twist instead. Now, last week, we looked at the internal forces. We knew that if the object was static, any component of it needed to be static. Or there is some internal forces that's making sure it's static. And we want to know what those internal forces are. That way, we could figure out what members would be strong enough to resist those internal loads. So what we did was we pretended to cut it here, and then we drew all of our forces in tension. But when we went through and solved it, if we had something in simple bending, we saw that the top cord was in compression and the bottom cord was in tension. So I'm just drawing it here this way because this has been already calculated. Somebody has already figured out that the top cord is in compression and the bottom cord is in tension. And we can draw a little placeholder here for this web element. Well, we know that drawing one uh, on the diagonal is always kind of a pain in the butt. We like to break it up into its X and Y components. We know that that is the easiest thing to do. So we'll often break it up into its X and Y components. And we know that we've drawn it that we're breaking it right here or that we're cutting it right here, but it's going to be the same as if we cut it right here, just after the node. So this is really acting along this plane. Remember, it was those triangles that we drew. So we could bring that down here. So now we've got our Y component of our web element. We've got compression in the top and we've got tension in the bottom. That includes the tension from the bottom cord and the X component of our web element. Well, look at these two. Those are equal and opposite forces with a distance between them. What, what do we call those when we have equal and opposite forces with a distance between them? 
that's a moment couple. We know that this is equivalent to a moment. It's something that's going to cause it to rotate but not translate. So, what if we were looking at a solid object here instead of our truss? We're making the same cut in the same spot and we've got our uh, component in the, the y-axis and we've got our top and bottom chord elements. But we could represent that internal force, that's a top and bottom chord compression and tension, as a couple or as a moment. Because we know that these two arrows like this is equivalent to this. We don't know the value of this, but if we wanted to find out the internal forces in this object, these two things are the same. And in this object, we don't have specific small elements that we could analyze it for. What if we used a general placeholder of moment when we made our internal cup? We could break it down to tension and compression if we wanted. But what if we used a moment as a placeholder to find the internal moment in this object? So remember bending, that force that acts to bend a component, putting one side of the part in tension and the opposite side in compression. It's the same as tension-compression couples, which is what I said earlier. So we have that gap like that. So we're going to go through and we are going to use the same principles we did on our truss, but with a beam. So we will, the first thing we always do is solve our free body diagram for our reactions. We'll figure out what those are and then we'll start making cuts on this beam to figure out what the internal forces are. This is the exact same thing that we did in the truss element. We have a few examples to go through and the same way I do for absolutely everything, I'm going to show you the really hard way to do it and then I'm going to show you a really easy way to do it and then I'm going to show you an even easier way to do it. Here's the catch. You have to do one of those two harder methods for um, some of the work that we're going to have to go through because it is mandated, it is required. We have to show that you understand or at least generally grasp the concept of method of sections for internal forces in a beam or even a column. But I will also make sure that as we hit next term when we get into structures two, you're not going to have to do it using method of sections anymore. You will be able to do it using the beam tables which will help you out drastically. But this term, get method of sections in your head and project part two. Please do method of sections. There is a big chunk of points assigned to method of sections. I've written it out in the outline for the project. I've told you time and time again that we have to do method of sections for this course. We're gonna do some examples next week where I do the method of sections approach. You can make handy use of the tables, the easy way I'm going to show you to verify that you've done your method of sections check correctly, but for your project, please let me give you all the points I can possibly give you. Do method of sections. You'll still be able to verify it with the easy way. So I'm going to flip down into uh, looking at my paper mode now because pretty much the rest of this lecture is doing examples um, using method of sections. So I'll make that flip right now. Alright, so we have our 15 meter long beam. We know it's a pin roller condition. So we know that it can resist, there's this reaction here that could resist a load if it was applied in the x direction. It doesn't look like there is one applied in the x direction, so we know that when we sum the forces in the x direction it will be zero. But what if there had been a load applied in that direction? Well, then we would know that we could use this reaction to find the internal load there. Maybe then there would also be, a, we, when we did our uh, sections here, there would be uh, an x axis or an axial load that we'd have to solve. And we're going to do an example like that next week when we do moment frames. There's a 20 kilonewton load applied at the middle of the 15 meter long beam. So 7.5 on either side. We want to find what the internal forces are in this beam. That seems simple enough, right? So we want to know what the internal forces are. So where? 
where do we want to know the internal forces? Well, I would say we want to know what the internal forces are where they're the worst. But we don't know where the internal forces are the worst, so we're probably going to have to check in several spots and then figure out what the worst case internal forces are. And maybe they're not the same for each type of internal load. And remember, we want to make sure that we pick a beam that is strong enough to transfer this 20 kilonewton load out to its reactions. So something actually has to take this load and get it over to these endpoints. So to do that, to make sure we know we have a beam that's strong enough, we have to figure out what the loads are. And then next term, we'll figure out, we'll be able to figure out if our member is strong enough to resist those loads. So let's start by drawing out our beam. Remember, I always like to... Uh, I always like to draw my problem. It's helpful to know what's going on. So this is um, beam one. So we've got beam one, and we know that we had a 15 meter long beam. And so this was 15 meters, and we know at the halfway point there was a load applied. We know at the halfway point there was a load applied of 20 kilonewtons. Um, and then I'm all of a sudden, no, okay, my mic is recording. All of a sudden I had a, a horrible fear that it wasn't actually recording sound. That happened to me one time last term and I cried because I had recorded six hours of lectures with no mic operating. Even though it was showing me that it was working, I, I don't know whatever happened to that. We know that it's a pin roller condition. They actually drew in the reactions for us, but if this thing isn't moving up and down, back and forth, and spinning in space, we know that there could be an Rx reaction and I'm going to call it R1 and R2, and that these two things could resist any moment um, that was applied to this thing or anything that made it want to spin because we have forces in the same direction some distance apart. Um, it doesn't look like there is a load applied to this, but we'll go through and we'll solve it, trying to be consistent regardless. Now, I always like to take a guess. What do you think the reactions are going to be here? This is where it's always handy to take a guess. If I stood in the middle of that table behind me that you guys have seen me sit on before, how much of my load would go to each end of the table? And we've talked about it before, half seems like a reasonable guess. So my guess is, is that 10, kilometer, 10 kilonewtons will go here and 10 kilonewtons will go over here. Let's solve for those those reactions. So solve for the reactions. Let's sum the forces in the x direction, everything going in that direction being uh, positive. Well, we can see that there is no applied load. We just have our unknown reaction. So our x equals zero. If there had been an applied load here, our x wouldn't be zero but we just happen to have no applied load in the x direction. Now let's sum our moments about the z-axis and let's pick, I'm gonna pick R1. I'm lazy, I'm kinda consistent. You could pick R2, it does not matter, but I'm gonna imagine that the thumbtack is right here on my free body diagram. And I want to know what it takes to make sure that this thing doesn't move, or I want the sum of all of the moments to be zero. Anything spinning in this direction is positive. Well, if my thumbtack is right here, R1 is passing through the point, so it doesn't cause a moment. 
our x is passing through it, so it doesn't cause a moment. I have my 20 kilonewtons and my r2. 20 kilonewtons tries to spin it in that direction. So if I curl my fingers in that direction and then stick my thumb out, my thumb will tell me if it's positive or negative. My thumb's pointing into the page, so that is a minus 20 kilonewtons. And to be a moment, we need a force and a distance. So its distance is 7.5 kilonewtons. R2 is causing it to spin in that direction. If I curl my fingers in the direction it's trying to make it spin and then point my thumb, that tells me that it's in the positive direction. So plus R2 times 15 meters equals zero. Well, we can rearrange this. We'll bring this over to this side and then divide by 15, or 20 times 7.5 divided by 15 equals R2 equals 10 kilonewtons. Ooh, that's exactly what we guessed. So good. Seems like we're doing it right. It's handy to do some where it's obvious what the answers are sometimes so that you can test the methods, learn the methods, and then you know that the methods work for ones that are slightly more complicated. All right, let's now do our third equation. Let's sum our forces in the y direction, where everything upwards is positive. Well, we've got our r1 going upwards. We've got our 20 kilonewtons going downwards. And we've got our r2 going upwards but we've already solved for that, and we know that it's 10. So we can rearrange this. We'll bring the minus 20 over, and it becomes positive. We'll bring the plus 10 over, and it becomes negative. We end up with, oops, 20 minus 10 equals 10. So R1 equals 10 kilonewtons. So again, this all pans out and matches what we expected would happen. Let's talk about cutting our sections. Where are we going to cut our sections? Because we want to know how this 20 kilonewtons gets all the way over to here to be a 10 kilonewton reaction right here. Now, gut check, how much internal force do you think is trying to slip past each other right here? If we know that we have to get 10 kilonewtons over to here, in an up and down direction, what do you think the internal up and down direction force is going to be inside there? My gut says 10 kilonewtons and probably 10 kilonewtons over here, but we don't really know. We haven't done anything, but something has to get 10 kilonewtons over to here. So let's talk about where these cuts would be. Where am I going to make my cuts? I don't really know. So what if I just picked a few spots? I'm going to pick right here and right here. Let's maybe make this 3.75, and I'm going to make this cut right here um, at 11.25. That would tell me what's happening at those points, but that doesn't seem like enough. Maybe I want to make a few more cuts. I probably want to know what's happening pretty darn close to this reaction point. What if I made a cut right here at 0 0.00000000001? Or I could round that to 1. Or, sorry, I round that to 0. It is so close to just after the reaction, we might as well call it 0, but it's just after the reaction. What if I did the same thing right here, where I made a cut just this side of my applied 20 kilonewtons. So at um, 7.4999999999999. Or I could round it to 7.5, but I know it's just before the 20 kilonewtons. And then what if I made a cut at 7.5000000001? So again, it is rounded to 7.5, but I know I'm making my cut just after the 20 kilonewtons been applied. And then what if I did the same thing right here, just before 15 kilonewtons? So this is at 7.5 and 7.5.
How do I know to cut there? I don't. I'm just cutting everywhere I think something interesting is happening and at two spots where it doesn't look like anything interesting is happening at all. If I went through this and I didn't have enough information to kind of figure things out, I would probably need to do something more. Now, for those of you that are math buffs, what I am essentially doing right here is limited calculus. Calculus is the technique of making analysis at a sequence of spots in very small repetitions right after each other. Or if we made a cut at zero, and then at 0, 0.0000001, and then at 0, 0.00000002, maybe there's not much interesting happening in between those two cuts. So I'm going to start with these cuts and see if it looks like anything interesting might happen in between them. If not, I'm going to feel pretty good about the section cuts I've made. So let's let's start with an easy one. I'm going to pick right here. Let's let's do a cut at 3.75 meters. So let's do a cut there. Well, if I'm making a cut at 3.75 meters, I'm lazy. I always tend to keep the left-hand section of my cut, um, but you can keep the other side. It is totally fine. I just like to be consistent for myself. So I'm going to always keep the left-hand side, all right? So I am going to make a cut right here that looks like that, and I am going to keep this side of the, uh, the member. But we know that we've solved for this reaction, and it's 10 kilonewtons, and this 10 kilonewtons is only true because we have a 15 meter long beam with a 20 kilonewton load applied at 7.5 meters. So we are not ignoring the fact that that 20 kilonewton load is applied to it because this R1 is dependent on that 20 kilonewtons. So let's make that cut. So I'm cutting it right there at 3.75 meters. And we know that there is a 10 kilonewton reaction right here and zero kilonewtons right here. Well, this doesn't look stable, does it? This looks like it wants to fly off into space. So there must be something internal keeping this from moving. We saw that when we made a cut internally on a beam, we could use some placeholders. We could use an internal shear force and an internal bending moment as a placeholder. So I'm going to call this V and M. That's representing shear because I'm talking about what's happening at that plane. And this is moment, which we know is representing that tension and compression that happens in the top and bottom cord of a bending element. Now, I am going to show you, um, well, a lot of people ask, why did I draw my shear downwards? Eh, that's habit. You're going to see why I do it sometimes, why I do it that way pretty consistently in a minute. Um, you don't have to do it that way, but remember, um, uh, well, actually, positive and negative values for shear don't really mean much to us. They're helpful because they tell us when we cross over from positive to negative, but it's not like it makes a change in what's happening. So remember, axial forces, um, there's a big difference between tension and compression. Shear, whether it's going up or down, doesn't really make much of a difference to us. The other thing you're going to see I didn't do it for this one, but I often will draw my arrow for shear to look like that. Why do I do that? <clears throat> Again, I find the arrow keeping off one head makes it very clear I'm talking about shear because I am keeping this half of the section cut that I'm making. Um, this is a pretty standard way to draw shear for internal forces when we're talking about things. You don't have to do it. You can draw a full arrowhead, but you're going to see going forward, I often draw my shear, internal shear force, as half of an arrowhead. 
So I have a placeholder for my internal shear and my internal moment. I want to know what internal forces would have to be there to make this object not move. And I know for this object not to move, this object can't move, and that this reaction is dependent on this object. Let's use our usual equations that we use. Let's sum our forces in the y direction where everything upwards is positive, and we want to know what it takes for this section not to fly off upwards in space. We know we have 10 kilonewtons trying to make it happen, so there must be some internal force that stops it from happening. So we have 10 kilonewtons upwards, or a positive 10 kilonewtons, and I've drawn my shear force downwards, which is negative, so minus V. Those look like the only things going up and down. So I can rearrange this. I can bring my V over to the other side and make it positive. V equals 10 kilonewtons. Now, for those of you that have noticed, this is why I often draw my shear downwards because my reaction is usually going upwards and this makes it handy for me to get my very first shear value be positive. Don't worry about it. You can draw it upwards, you can draw it downwards, but be consistent. I'm going to tell you that I'm always going to draw it downwards, so if you want to easily reference my work or follow along, you should probably do it that way too. Now remember back here when we talked about how we knew half of this 20 kilonewtons had to get over here where our reaction was 10 kilonewtons? So something had to be happening in here that got that 10 kilonewtons to there. So something probably needed to be able to support 10 kilonewtons every step along its way. Well, look at that, that internal shear of 10 kilonewtons, which is those two planes slipping past each other. It seems like that is a good representation of what we guessed might happen. Let's solve for our internal moment now. Let's sum the moments about the z-axis where everything in that direction is positive, and we want to find out what it takes for it not to spin in space, and let's pick our point to spin it about. Now you're going to hate me a little bit because you're going to be like, why are you changing your spot? But I'm not. I'm going to show you that almost always when I do an internal cut, I'm going to pick the spot I cut to spin about. Mostly because it makes things a little bit easier. Remember, if there is a force passing directly through the node we're spinning about, it doesn't cause a moment. And so I like to pick this spot because if it was a more complicated problem, I don't have to worry about trying to solve for shear first. I could if I wanted, but shear is irrelevant if I'm spinning at about this point because that internal shear isn't causing it to spin. So I'm going to pick the point 3.75 to spin about. So I'm basically saying I'm putting my thumbtack right here. Well, let's look at our 10 kilonewtons. It's trying to make it spin in this direction. If I take my right hand and curl my fingers in the direction it's trying to spin, my thumb tells me if that's positive or negative. My thumb's pointing into the page, so this 10 kilonewtons is trying to spin it in a negative direction. Or minus 10 kilonewtons times, remember to be a moment, you need a force and a distance, that 10, millimeter, that 10 kilonewtons is 3.75 meters away. The shear passes directly through the point, and so we want to figure out what our unknown moment is, or we're left with our unknown moment, which we've drawn spinning in the positive direction. So we can rearrange this, and it looks like we can find that m equals 37.5. m equals 37.5 kilonewton meters. So at 3.75 meters in this beam, we know there is an internal shear force of 10 kilonewtons and an internal bending moment of 37.5 kilonewton meters. 
That's kind of handy. We have some information. Let's try doing another cut. I am going to mess with you, not mess with you. I already told you where we were doing all the cuts. I'm going to make this cut right here just after the reaction. So let's cut at zero or 0 0.00000000001 or more zeros, however you want to think about it. But so much so that I'm making it so small that it, I would only ever put it in my calculator as zero. So I'm making a cut just this side of my reaction. So I'm going to draw a little distance there, but I'm going to denote that distance as zero. I know that I have my 10 kilonewton reaction here and that that is zero kilonewtons. I'm not even solving for x because it's zero. I'm not putting an internal um, x force in there because we know it would be zero. We know that there are the possibility for two internal forces to be happening here. I'm going to use my placeholder for shear, internal shear and I'm going to use my placeholder for the internal moment. I want to know what those internal forces are to make sure that this thing doesn't move in space. Let's use our same old usual equations. Sum the forces in the y direction where everything upwards is positive. I've got 10 kilonewtons upwards and I've got an unknown shear downwards. I can rearrange this, and shear equals 10 kilonewtons. That kind of makes sense, right? Because right here, as the, the closest we could possibly get to our reaction, our reaction's trying to push up, and this is trying to push down. Um, so, oh, sorry, I'm getting a phone call. Um, uh, we know that those two are trying to slip past each other by some amount. And um, if one is going downwards, the other one's trying to go upwards. Or we don't want that to happen. We don't want anything to move there. And they're so close together, they're essentially right on top of each other. Let's sum our moments about the z-axis, uh, where everything spinning in that direction is positive, and we want to know what it takes for this not to move. And we're going to make our cut right here, or at zero. So we're spinning about that point right there, but don't forget that at that point right there, our 10 kilonewtons actually passes right through it, and our shear passes right through it. Or you could say it was 10 kilonewtons trying to spin it in that direction, but our distance away is zero. So, 10 times 0 would be 0. So all we're left with is our unknown moment. Well, that seems easy. We have no moment at the reaction. That is good because, look, we don't have a moment reaction here. If we ended with moment at the end of our beam, that moment would have to go somewhere. And if we're only making a connection that can't resist moment, it's a pin connection, then our object doesn't work. So we purposely very much do not want there to be moment there. And it looks like that's what we've got happening. So let's make a cut at 7.5 meters, but we're really saying just before the 20 kilonewton uh, point load is applied, or at 7.499999999999. So, so close to just before the 20 kilonewtons is applied. So, we know that this is 7.5 meters. We know that there is a 10 kilonewton load applied here, 
or a reaction, 10 kilonewton reaction there, and, a hun and 0 kilonewtons there. And we want to know what the internal forces V and M are. So let's go through the same process. Let's sum our forces in the y direction with everything upwards being positive. We've got 10 kilonewtons minus V. We've got our 10 kilonewtons going up and our V going down equals 0. V equals 10 kilonewtons. So it looks like at, at, at this point it was 10 kilonewtons, at this point it was 10 kilonewtons, and at this point is te it's 10 kilonewtons. Do you think it's worth me doing any more cuts in here for shear? I, I think if I'm getting consistently all the way along that it's 10 kilonewtons, I've probably got a good answer there. Let's take a look at moment. We've got moment spinning in that direction. Uh, is positive of the z-axis. I'm going to do my cut at 7.5 meters. So I'm going to to spin my moments about this point right here. I'm going to put my thumbtack at the 7.5 meter mark. I've got 10 kilonewtons trying to spin it in that direction, or minus 10 kilonewtons times 7.5, and then shear passes right through it, and M is trying to spin it in the positive direction. M equals 75 kilonewton meters. Well, it looks like this is pretty consistent that it is the reaction times however far away from the reaction I've made my cut. If it was uh, um, 3.75 meters away, I multiplied it by 10. If it was 7.5 meters away, I multiplied it by my 10 kilonewtons. Or the moment in this gets bigger as I get further away from my reaction. Let's make a cut at 7.5 meters, or let's call this cut 7.5000000000001. So I'm going to cut it just on the other side of the 20 kilonewtons now. So just a hair past the 20 kilonewtons. So this is still pretty much essentially 7.5 meters. I know that I have a 10 kilonewton reaction here, with zero in the x-axis, but now I'm cutting just past where the 20 kilonewton load has been applied. And I want to know what internal forces stop this from moving in space. So this one looks like it's going to be a little bit different. I have that 20 kilonewtons to worry about now. Well, let's sum our forces in the y direction, where everything upwards is positive. I've got 10 kilonewtons going up. I've got 20 kilonewtons going down, so it's negative. And I've got my shear going down, which is negative. Let's rearrange this and solve for v. I'll bring my 20 kilonewtons, I'll bring my v over here and make it positive. So I've got 10, oh, I've got 10 minus 20, I get minus 10 kilonewtons. All right, so something's happened. There is a difference here. All of these ones, we had 10 kilonewtons of shear over here. Over here, it looks like I've got minus 10 kilonewtons of shear. Here's the thing. I don't really care, or we don't really care, what the ultimate value of shear is. We often talk about it in absolute terms, so we won't often refer to positive or negative shear. We would just say 10 kilonewtons of shear. But it is important 
until we're done solving our free body diagram to pay attention to whether we had a positive or a negative value. Let's sum our moments, with everything in that, spinning in that direction being positive, about the z-axis, and I'm going to pick my 7.5 meter cut to be the spot I spin it about. And I am going to put my thumbtack right here. My 10 kilonewtons tries to make it spin in that direction. My thumb points down, so it's negative. Minus 10 times 7.5. My 20 kilonewtons passes right through the point, And my shear passes right through the point. So essentially, it's 20 kilonewtons times 0. And then I've got my positive moment. I can rearrange this, and I get m equals 75 kilonewton meters. So it's the same. So at the point of applied load, my shear switched, but my moment stayed the same. It might be handy for us if we drew a diagram of this when we got to the end. That might help us. So let's keep that in mind so we could keep track of everything that's going on here. Maybe a diagram would be handy for us. So we'll keep that right there. Let's move on and make our next cut. So we've done this point, this point, this point, and this point. Let's try cutting at 11.25 now. So cut at 11.25 meters. So we're going to remind ourselves that that is 11.25 meters. We know that there is a point where that load is applied. I'm going to remind myself that that is 7.5 meters. Remember to be a true free body diagram, you need all of the loads and reactions, but also where they occur. So that's 20 kilonewtons, and we have our reactions. Okay, so now, oh, we're missing something. I need my internal unknown shear and moment. So let's sum the forces in the y direction where everything upwards is positive. We've got 10 kilonewtons going up, we've got 20 kilonewtons going down, and we've got our shear going down. We can rearrange this and V equals minus 10 kilonewtons. Huh. That's the same thing it was just on this side of the 20 kilonewtons. It's almost like of this 20 kilonewtons, half of it's trying to make it over here and half of it's trying to make it over here. So it kind of makes sense that we'd have 10 kilonewtons of internal shear on this side and 10 kilonewtons of internal shear on this side. Let's sum our moments with everything in that direction being positive about the z-axis, and I'm going to pick point 11.25 to spin about, so I'm going to put my thumbtack right here. So if I put my thumbtack right here, 10 kilonewtons is trying to spin it in that direction, which is negative, or minus 10 kilonewtons times 11.25. I've got 20 kilonewtons trying to spin it in that direction, which is positive, so plus 20 times, and so how far away is our 20 kilonewtons from that point? Well, it is 11.25 minus 7.5 away, or 3.75 meters away. My shear passes through it, so it's not trying to make it spin, and I have my positive moment, or my assumed positive moment. I can solve for this, and m equals, I would bring this over, and I would have 
10 times 11.25 minus 20 times 3.75. And I get 37.5 kilonewton meters. All right, one more cut, and then maybe we'll be able to figure some stuff out about this. Let's cut just before our reaction at the other end. So let's cut at 15 meters. Or really we're saying we're cutting at 14.9999999999 meters. Or if we were plugging it into our calculator, our calculator would just round that to 15. But we're doing it just before we're at the reaction. Did I draw this one, two, one, two, three, four, five, one, two. Okay, we know that this is 15 meters and at the halfway point, we've got our applied load or 20 kilonewtons. Would you do me a huge favor? Would, would you be willing to give me some water? Thank you. There's a cookie there if you want it too. For cookies, I guess. All right, so we've got our last free body diagram almost drawn, or partial free body diagram almost drawn. We want to know what internal forces keeps this thing from moving. So our internal shear and our internal moment. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. We can now sum our forces in the y direction with everything upwards being positive. We've got 10 kilonewtons upwards, 20 kilonewtons downwards, and our shear downwards. We get minus 10 kilonewtons. So it looks like everywhere on this side sees minus 10 kilonewtons of shear. Let's sum our moments with everything in that direction being positive about the z-axis, and we'll do it at the 15 meter mark, or where we've made our cut, and we want to know what it takes for it not to spin, or what the sum of those moments to be zero. All right, so we've got, if our thumbtack is here, 10 kilonewtons trying to spin it in that direction, or minus 10 kilonewtons times 15 meters, and we've got our 20 kilonewtons trying to spin it in that direction, or plus 20 kilonewtons times its distance away from the point we're trying to spin about, which is 7.5 meters, Shear is passing through it, so it's not causing it to spin. We've got our unknown moment that's trying to spin it in the positive direction. We can rearrange this, and we can solve for moment. We can take these over here. So we have 10 times 15 minus 20 times 7.5. Zero. So again, good thing, at our other reaction, we have nowhere for a moment to go. It can't just disappear. Uh, so if we don't have something that can take moment here, it would be pretty crappy if we ended up with a moment at the end of this. You're saying to yourself, but we end up with a shear at the end of this. Yeah, and our shear turns into our reaction too. Remember our reaction was 10 kilonewtons? Well, our shear is 10 kilonewtons at the end there. So there, it does have somewhere to go. Let's maybe formalize this for ourselves a little bit. I am just going to, I'm gonna draw a few things here. I'm gonna draw a line here, 
I'm going to draw a line here, and I'm going to draw the same line down here. So for myself, I'm just going to redraw my free body diagram right here so that I remember everything that I was looking at. So this is my 15 meters, and I know that at the halfway mark, there is a load applied. That is the 20 kilonewtons, and this was 10 kilonewtons, and this was 10 kilonewtons. All right, let's just remind ourselves what was happening with all of our shear values. So um, we made a few cuts. So we made um, we made a cut at, so let's look at our distance x, and let's look at what our shear was in kilonewtons. And this is in meters. So at zero meters, our shear was 10 kilonewtons. At 3.75 meters, our shear was 10 kilonewtons. At 7.5 meters, our shear was 10 kilonewtons. But then, also at 7.5 meters, our shear was minus 10 kilonewtons. At 11.25 meters, our shear was minus 10 kilonewtons. And at 15 meters, our shear was minus 10 kilonewtons. I'm going to draw that for myself. I'm just going to see what that looks like. If I had, if I write my shear, uh, as uh, roughly to scale, that's 10 kilonewtons, and that's 10 kilonewtons, and that's 10 kilonewtons, with a shift right here down to minus 10 kilonewtons. My littlest is having some freak out issues today. So this is 10 kilonewtons, and this is 10 kilonewtons. So again, we care about positive and negative for shear only to keep track of when it crosses the datum, but as an absolute value, we don't really care that much. We just want to know what the maximum value is. So what's the maximum shear value in this? Ah, well, max shear is 10 kilonewtons. Whether it's positive or negative is kind of irrelevant. Um, I always like to color in these things just so it's clear. And this, my friends, is a shear force diagram. So we'll often do a little diagram to show us what our shear forces look like, our internal shear forces. Let's talk about the moments we calculated at various points along its length. So let's write our x, our distance in meters, and let's write our moment in kilonewton meters. Well at x equals zero, we had zero moment. At x equals 3.75 meters, we had a moment equals 37.5 kilonewton meters. At x equals 7.5 meters, our moment equals 75 kilonewton meters. On the other side of our applied load, our moment was the exact same. Then at 11.25 meters, we calculated 37.5 kilonewton meters. And at 15 meters, where the reaction is, we had no moment. I hope my nanny doesn't quit because my son is being a bit obnoxious today. Um, so let's draw this out. We've got, sorry, 75 uh, kilonewton meters here. 
um, right about here we have 37.5 and 0 and 0. Well, look at that. What's the maximum moment? It looks like m max equals 75 kilonewton meters. And again, because I like to draw these things in. And this is a bending moment diagram. You are going to have to do this process that I just did in your project part two. We're going to do more of these, don't worry about it, and I'm going to show you maybe some tricks that some people find easier. You can do it this way with absolute numbers. I am okay with that, but I'm going to show you a way that it could be a little bit easier um, to solve for something in general principles. So what if we had this exact same beam, but we didn't know what the load was, and we didn't know how long it was. We just knew that there was a load applied at the middle of the beam. Okay, so we're going to do this same problem, but we're going to do it using placeholders um, for ourselves. All right, so let's start doing the same beam, but with no values. So beam 01, no values. And I know you're thinking, why are you going to make us do it with no values? Can't we just use values? Well, I'm going to show you why. It will be clear to you in the end why this is a very, very handy thing to do. We're going to go do it twice. We're going to do it with this beam and another beam. The other beam is easier. You're going to really like that one. And in fact, the second beam we do might be almost exactly like what you have to do in your project part two. So let's draw that same beam. Uh, and we don't know how long it is, so we'll call it L. We're going to use L as a placeholder for the length. We do know that there was a load at the midpoint of it. It's the only thing we know, but we don't know what the load is. So we're going to call it P. We know it's halfway on the beam, or one half of the length from each end. We know that there must be unknown reactions, R1 and R2. And I'm just going to, I'm going to go ahead and write that as zero because there's no applied X load. So I don't even have to sum my forces in the X direction. I know that that's zero. Well, let's take a guess. If this is force P, how much do you think R1 and R2 are each going to be? If when it was 20 kilonewtons, they were each 10, or half of the total load, my guess is that these are each going to be half P. Let's go through and try that out. Let's test that theory. Let's sum our moments where everything's spinning in that direction is positive. We're going to spin it about the z-axis, and I'm lazy, so I almost always pick my right reaction when I'm solving for my overall reactions. So I'm saying I'm putting a thumbtack right here, and P is trying to spin it in that direction, or if I curl my fingers in the direction it's trying to spin, it's negative. Minus P times... one half L away. So P is one half of the total length away from that point. And then I have reaction two, which is trying to spin it in the positive direction. So plus R2, and it is L away, or the full distance L away. We want to know what R2 is, remember? 
and L are our placeholders, so we don't mind them being on the other side or in the equation side. But R2 is what we're interested in finding. So let's um, bring this over here and divide out by L. Um, my poor little guy, he's having a rough day. He's in a rough shape today. I think I might be needed. Hold on a second, team. Okay. Um, we have reaction R2. And we're going to bring this over here and it becomes positive. And we'll divide out by L. Or we have positive 1 half L divided by L. Or 1 half P. So that's exactly what we guessed was going to happen. Let's sum our forces in the y direction, where everything upwards is positive. We have R1 going upwards, we have P going downwards, and we have R2 going upwards. But we've solved for R, we know it's 1 half P. We can rearrange this. So we end up with um, minus 1 plus a half is minus a half, and you bring it over here. R1 equals 1 half P. So that makes sense. When we had 20 kilonewtons as P, our reactions were each 1 half of P. So now we know what our reactions are here. Let's do the same thing we did before. But remember, when we cut, we cut just this side of the reaction right here and just this side of P. Basically, we made three cuts between these two points. Well, what if we just used a placeholder X for anywhere we might cut along there? And then, what if we did the same thing over here? Anywhere between here and here, we used a placeholder X to make a cut. So let's try that. Let's do the section before P. So we're going to make a cut right here like this, but we don't know where exactly this cut is. It's cut X. So somewhere along there, it could be almost zero. It could be almost half of L. So this is between 0 and 1 half L. We know that over here we have a reaction of 1 half P and 0. Is everything okay? Does he need more food? Oh, okay, thank you, Jackie. It's before our applied load. We know we have, there must be some internal forces that keeps this from moving. So we have um, a placeholder for our unknown shear and our unknown moment. So now we can do the same things we always do. We can sum our forces in the y direction where everything upwards is positive. So we've got one half p from this and we've got minus V equals zero, or V equals one-half P. So anywhere between zero and one-half L, V equals one-half P. What if we were at zero? Huh? V equals one-half P. What if we were at a quarter of L? Huh? V equals one-half P. What if we were at one-half P? Huh? V equals one-half P exactly the same as we had in our last example. Now let's sum our moments with everything going in that direction being positive about the z-axis and we're gonna make our, we're gonna spin about point x or right here. I'm gonna put my thumbtack right here. Well, one half p tries to spin it in that direction so I've got one half p trying to spin it in the negative direction. 
times distance x away. V passes through the point I'm trying to spin about, so it doesn't cause a moment, and then I have my positive moment. So plus m equals zero. If I uh, bring this over here, I get m equals one-half px. And this is kilonewtons, and this is kilonewton meters. Well, that's handy. If we think about that last example we did, um, what was the moment if we applied 20 kilonewtons when we were at zero? 0.5 times 20 times zero. Ah, zero. What happens when we multiplied it by 3.75? We got 37.5. What happens when we were all the way at 7.5? 75. So instead of needing to do three separate cuts, we only needed to do one cut as a placeholder for anywhere in that zone. Let's now try doing the section over here on this side, or the section after P, or between one half L and L. So there's our, uh, our section. We're making a cut at X. We know we have our reaction 1 half P here. And that there is an applied load, but we don't know what it is, of P. And this is one half L. So now let's, oh, we need to draw in our unknown shear and moment that stops this thing, the internal forces that stops this thing from sliding up and down or spinning in space. We want to sum our forces in the y direction with everything upwards being positive. We've got positive one-half P minus P minus V equals zero. Well, we end up with, uh, uh, um, so we have one-half P minus P V, we bring our V over, we end up with V equals minus one-half P kilonewtons. Again, exactly like we saw before. If we had 20 kilonewtons as our applied point load, when um, our length is 7.5, 7 huh? V was minus 1 half 20, or minus 10. When we were at 11.25, V equaled minus 10. When we were at 15, V equaled minus 10. Let's sum our moments um, about this point right here where everything's spinning in that direction is positive. And we're going to pick point X. So I'm putting my thumbtack right here. My one half P is trying to spin it in that direction, or minus one half P times X. I've got P trying to spin it in that direction, or the positive direction. So plus P times this distance away. This distance is X minus one half L, or X minus one half L. And then we have our positive moment. V passes right through the point, so it's not trying to make it spin. So let's do this in stages. We've got minus one half P X plus P times X, or P X, 
minus one half p l plus moment equals zero. Let's bring these over to the other side. M equals, so this works out to be uh, one half p x. We're going to bring it over to the other side, so it's minus one half p x. And then that comes over to the other side and is plus one half p l. So anywhere between p and reaction two, we have an equation for our moment. And it is minus one half p x plus half p l. Let's maybe give ourselves a little chart for this. We already have our, uh, our, our um, free body diagram drawn here. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to draw something so that I can draw my shear force diagram and a bending moment diagram. So this is going to be shear force diagram and bending moment diagram. This is going to be in kilonewton meters and that's going to be in kilonewtons. Let's write ourselves a little chart about what all these values are. So, um, let's write um, let's write our our length and our shear and our moment. Uh, so at x equals zero to x equals one half l, v equals one half p, and m equals one half px and at x equals one half l to x equals l we add minus one half p and minus one half px plus one half pl I know it's a bit of a pain this is in meters this is in kilonewtons and this is in kilonewton meters units are important when you're doing this in your project, you'll get easy points by showing me the units. Well, let's plug in a few spots. Let's plug in um, x equals zero. Let's plug in x equals a quarter L, a half L just before P. Let's do a half L just after P. And let's do um, three quarters L and Let's do L. Well, it doesn't seem to matter. Uh, we end up with one half P, one half P, one half P, and then we switch to minus one half P, minus one half P, and minus one half P. We can even plot that out here for ourselves. Where's my halfway mark here? So it looks like it didn't really matter uh, what x was. We had pretty consistent p's. It just, or um, shears, it just mattered when we hit that load. In fact, look. Look at that length right there. This is 1 half p, and this is 1 half p. This total length right here is p. Huh almost exactly P. It's like that causes our change in shear at that location. All right, moment. Let's plug in our moments. At, at zero, our moment is one half PX, or X equals zero. Multiply that all out, our moment gets becomes zero. Let's plug in one quarter L into X. 
we have one half P times one quarter L is one eighth P L. One half L for X is one half P times one half L or one quarter P L. He is intense in there today. Oh. All right. Now we're switching to our other equations. We've crossed P, and so now we have to use this big, ugly equation. All right, you're not going to have to go through this. I'm going to do it for you, but it's nice to just see it be done. So at 1 half L, we're going to plug that into X. We have minus 1 half P times 1 half P, or one half L, or we have minus one quarter P L plus one half P L, or one half P L minus one quarter P L gives us one quarter P L. Let's plug in three quarters. We end up with um, uh, minus three eighths P L plus one half PL and gives us one eighth PL. If we plug in L, we have minus one half PL plus one half PL or zero. I didn't draw a very good line there, did I? And this is one quarter PL. Um, so we now know that V max equals one half P, whether it's positive or negative, and M max equals one quarter PL kilonewton meters. Let's see if that's true. Remember our moment, our maximum moment was 75 when we had a P of 20 and a length of 15? 0.25 times 20 times 15. Look at that. 75. So we could do it this way or we could do it this way. This one seems more intimidating, but it actually ends up being a lot less work. Let's take a look at our slides here for a second. So we went through and did all that, and then we just went through and did all of this. So we're going to talk about something else now. We're going to do another type of beam. I've got to stop this. I'll come back in just a second. Guys. Okay, so the next beam problem we're going to solve has a uniformly distributed load on it. Remember, a joist picking up deck might have a uniformly distributed load on it. A beam picking up um, a larger deck might have a uniformly distributed load on it. Sometimes we'll treat a beam with point loads from joists, if there's enough of them, as a uniformly distributed load. You, in your project part two, for the beams, you can treat it, if you have joists framing into it, you can treat it as a uniformly distributed load. That is an acceptable thing that gets done in the design industry. Trusses will often treat as being point loads at the nodes, and a beam will often be treated as having a uniformly distributed load on it, even if it's got some, uh, its point loads are from joists. So uniformly distributed loads are great and we can still solve those, except we have to remember that when we're solving things, we act like the load is happening in the center of its application. So if this is a uniformly distributed load, we will often use an analogous point load to represent it, and we would put it at the center of this distance. So we would multiply this uniformly distributed load by this length and apply it as a point load 
halfway along this distance, or through its centroid, if you wanted to talk about it that way. So this could be represented by this analogous point load. This is not the free body diagram. This is the free body diagram. But we can use this analogous point load or representation of the uniformly distributed load as a point load to help us solve these reactions. But this is the free body diagram, not this. So remember that because at least five of you are going to, in the project where it says show me the free body diagram, are going to draw this. But it is very much this. We will make use of this to solve for our reactions or our internal forces. So what would the analogous point load of this look like? Well, we know that the area under this is this distance times our uh, uniformly distributed load divided by 2 because it's a triangle. And then triangles act at 2 thirds of their length, so it would act right here. Let's take a look. We would use an analogous point load of P is D2 times W, but divided by 2 because it's a triangle, and then this distance D to where it acts is this D1 plus 2 thirds of D2, so acting right here. That's going to be handy because this is what our next beam looks like. We're just going to jump right in and not do it with numbers because we've seen that that can be quicker. Now look at this. This same load keeps happening again and again and again and again and again and again everywhere along its length. We've got a placeholder W for its uniformly distributed load and we know that it is a pin roller support which for steel and wood is the majority of connections and we don't know how long it is. So let's go through and solve this beam using placeholders. Let's try doing this one. Let's make me bigger here. All right. Beam two, no values. So we have a beam of unknown length it has a load W on it in kilonewtons per meter our length is in meters I guess I didn't need the brackets there and we've got reaction one, and we've got reaction two. There's no load applied in the x direction, so I'm just going to call that zero. So this is the free body diagram. We need to find the reactions. So to find the reactions, we're going to use the analogous point load of this. Reaction 1, reaction 2, 0. So instead of this load, we are going to use the analogous point load acting halfway along its length because it's a rectangle. This load P is equal to W times L. So we know what we're saying is that this is the equivalent to this entire length times its load because this tells us how many kilonewtons per meter and this is how many meters we have. So our total kilonewtons is our kilonewtons meters times our meters. Or, we're saying that this is WL. 
This is what we can use to solve for our reactions. This is the analogous point load. Not free body diagram. Okay, let's sum our forces in the y direction with everything upwards. Actually, no, let's not do that one first. First, I am going to sum my moments with everything in that direction being positive about the z-axis, and I'm going to pick R1 to spin it about. And I want to know what it takes for this thing not to move around in space. Well, I'm spinning it about this point, so R1 doesn't cause it to spin. P does cause it to spin. P is it's trying to make it spin in the negative direction, or minus WL, times, and this is acting at one half L, or one half L. Put my thumb tack there. R2 is making it spin in that direction, which is positive, or R2 times L. R2 is what I really want to find here, so I can bring this over, it becomes positive. It would be 1 half WL squared, but then I've got to divide by L, and I get R2 equals 1 half WL. So we know one of our reactions now. R2 equals 1 half WL. Let's sum our forces in the y direction, where everything upwards is positive. We've got R1, which we don't know what it is. We've got minus P, um, and we have plus R2, but we know what R2 is. R2 is plus one half WL. P, I might as well just rewrite this as WL right there. So we have R1 minus WL plus one half WL gives us minus one half WL. We bring it over to the other side. R1 equals one half WL, or half of P, because that's what our analogous point load is, essentially. But P, we know, is really all of this multiplied by the length. So we have established our reactions. Let's try to cut this somewhere between zero and L. Let's do a section cut somewhere where x equals 0 to L. So anywhere along that length. Let's draw what that looks like. So we're going to call this cut x. We know that this reaction, R1, we've solved is 1 half WL. We know that that's zero. And we know that we have this load W applied to it. Now, we know that this is a cut. So this, for this object not to be moving up and down or spinning or sliding back and forth, there must be something internal happening here. So V and moment, representing internal forces that we want to calculate. This is the partial free body diagram. This is a bit hard to solve because we don't have a load to work with, nothing. So we are going to 
use an analogous partial free body diagram. So let's draw what that looks like. Same thing we did before, we still have our one half WL, and that is zero. We need to know what that force is. Well, that force is this length times W, or Wx. This distance is x, and we want to know what internal shear and moment is stopping this thing from moving around in space. So this is our partial analogous free body diagram. We now want to solve this to make sure that it doesn't move up and down in space or spin. So let's sum our forces in the y direction with everything upwards being positive. And we want to know what makes this thing not move or what the sum of all of those, we want the sum of all of those to be zero. We've got one half WL moving upwards or one half WL minus WX, and then right here we've got minus V. We can rearrange this. There's not really much to rearrange except we bring some things over here to this side. V equals WX minus one half WL. No, I shouldn't have changed those signs. Sorry. I'll bring that over. I knew it looked funny. V equals one half WL minus WX. I brought the V over and made it positive. So V equals one half WL minus X. Let's sum the moments about the z-axis where everything in that direction is positive. And the same way I've told you I often like to do, I'm going to spin it at the cut. So I'm putting my thumbtack right here. That gets rid of V from my problem. Look, because look what V was. Aren't you glad that we don't have to include that in what we spin about something? So V passes through that point. We've got our one-half WL reaction trying to spin it in that direction or the negative direction. So minus one-half WL times, and it is distance X away. Put our thumbtack right here. WX, or our analogous point load, is trying to spin it in that direction. Or plus WX times, and this distance right here is x divided by 2, or 1 half x. We have our moment trying to spin it in the positive direction. And that equals 0. M equals one half WLX minus one half WX squared. So both of these are divided by two, so we have one half WLX minus one half WX squared. These are annoying equations, but those are the equations. This tells us, with not too much work, what the moment is at any point along this beam. And this equation tells us what the shear is at any point along this beam. That seems kind of handy if you ask me. 
why don't we take it just a little bit further? Let's plop that right there so we can see it for reference. Let's look at a few points for this. Let's take a look at a few points. So we'll pick um, maybe at each end in the middle. Just Let's just start there at one half in the middle. You could definitely plug in more points. I would be totally happy for you to do that. So at x, at any point x, v equals 1 half wl minus wx, and moment equals 1 half wlx minus 1 half wl squared. Let's look at x equals 0. Well, at x equals 0, uh, we plug that in, that goes to 0, we get 1 half wl. Huh, what else was 1 half wl? Our reactions. That seems handy because we like it when our reaction and our shear are the same at the end. Um, moment, when x equals 0, well, there's an x in this part, so it turns into 0. Um, and uh, what, what did I write here? Oh, sorry, that's supposed to be x squared. So that goes to 0, and that goes to 0. Well, for a uniformly distributed load on a simply supported beam, it looks like at the end 0, there is no moment. Let's look at one-half L. So let's plug in one-half L here. So one-half WL minus one-half LW. Yeah. Zero. Let's plug one-half one L into this. All right. One-half WL one-half times one-half L or one-quarter WL squared, so one half or one quarter WL squared minus one half W one half squared L squared. If you add all of that up and work it out, you get WL squared divided by eight. You can go through and do it. You'll get WL squared divided by eight. So that's taking one half L and plugging it in for x and for x. Let's look at L here. 1 half WL minus WL minus 1 half L. And if we plug L in here, we get 1 half WL times L, or 1 half WL squared, minus 1 half WL squared. Zero. That seems like handy information. We could also plug in at a quarter and three quarters. You can do that on your own. I'm gonna sh sh I'm gonna draw these out, and you can assume that I did that. Let's draw this. So we had a free body diagram where that was L in meters. This was W in kilonewtons per meter. This was WL divided by 2, and this was WL divided by 2. Um, so this is our free body diagram. We're going to draw our shear diagram. So at this end, it is 1 half WL, or WL divided by 2. And at this end, it is minus uh, sorry, WL, or minus 1 half WL. If we went through and calculated this, we would find that these were 1 quarter WL, or 1 quarter WL. So this is a linear transition there. 
which makes sense because this these are both linear equations, or this is a linear equation. Let's draw, so this is our shear force diagram in kilonewtons. Let's draw our bending moment diagram. We know it's zero at the two points here, and we know that it is WL squared divided by 8 up here. If we went through and solved for it at the quarter points, we would see that the value isn't half of this. It's a little bit more than that, meaning that our diagram is a quadratic equation. Well, look at that. That makes sense because the equation we have is actually a quadratic equation. This is our bending moment diagram in kilonewton meters. And we know that V max equals one half WL. Um, it didn't matter if it was positive or negative. We know that it means the same thing. And our moment max is WL squared divided by 8 at the midpoint. Well, if what we want to know is make sure we've designed a beam that can resist the worst loads it could see, well, we need a beam that can resist this shear force and this moment, bending moment on it. So for a beam to work, we're going to need something that can resist one half the load times the length and a moment of the load times the length squared divided by 8. So let's just take a look here for a second. So here's that worked out. If I told you that a uniformly distributed load on a simply supported beam is 95% of the beams designed, well, if I told you that, wouldn't that lead you to believe that these that find the worst shear and the worst moment on a uniformly distributed load on a simply supported beam would be pretty darn important equations? Well, if you thought that, you would be right. Because for a uniformly distributed load on a simply supported beam using method of sections, we developed equations that find the reactions and the shear or the moment at, the, at a point anywhere along the beam, as well as the maximums. So we saw that reaction 1 and reaction 2 equaled each other, which was WL divided by 2, which also equaled the shear. These are the equations at any point along its length, but these equaled the maximum shear as well. Vmax, WL divided by 2, Mmax, WL squared divided by 8. These, you should know. You should know these. For a uniformly distributed load on a simply supported beam, we are, for this lecture, or maybe not again in this lecture, but in your assignment and in your project and definitely in the exam, and next term, we are going to use these a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. So you are going to want to know what these are. We derived these. We went through and did it. So if we went through and did it as a placeholder for any type of uniformly distributed load on a simply supported beam, do we have to go through and do it again? Uh, in theory, no. Going forward, you could probably not do it. For this course, for project part two, yeah, you got to do method of sections for me. I got to see it. You got to show it. And that's how I'll give you the marks. But after that, we can use these equations. The good thing is, is you know these equations, so you can check your work very handily. In fact, what if we had other beams? Here are the two we did. Uniformly distributed load on a simply supported beam. Concentrated point load at the center of a beam. Well, look at this. R is our reactions equals V, or the maximum V equals WL divided by 2. 
we just derived that. M maximum at center. WL squared divided by 8. We calculated that. Look at this equation. M at any point along its length. This would be WLX divided by 2 minus WX squared divided by 2. Well, that's exactly what we calculated. Here is the point load. 1. We calculated this and this and, well, that was, well, and we calculated that. So we were able to figure out all of these by using method of sections. There are a few other common types of beam arrangements that other people have created these same charts for. So look, you can have a triangularly distributed load on a simply supported beam. You can have a load that varies to a max at the midpoint. You can have a concentrated point load that's not at the center of the beam. You could have two equal concentrated point loads. Oops. Here's a good one, a uniformly distributed load on a backspan with a cantilever beam. Look at that moment diagram like that. So you are going to have to do some calculations where you do these by method of sections but it, you at least have some backup information. There are more of these. They have been uploaded. Um, they're in the project module. They're also in the module for handy downloads. So you can go through and take a look at those. For the exam, I would give you in the um, resource section anything that you would need from these. You can still look them up on your own, but I am going to give you a PDF that's like 20 pages long that pulls out all of the things in all of those tables and charts as one quick, easy reference. So you don't have, you know, 500 pages to flip through. You should be able to get everything you need off of those 20 pages, I think it is. Okay, so let's take a look at a simple span with a UDL of 6 meters long and 20 kilonewtons per meter of load. Well, we've just gone through and done this. You can do this I'm trying to decide if it's worth me going through and doing it. Um, let's see what we've got. I'm just going to flip through here for a second. Uh, there's a lot of these. We don't have time to go through them all. I wanted to give you guys some resources. So you're going to do one similar to this in your assignment that you don't actually have to do for the assignment. What I wanted to do was give you a ton of practice examples, ones that are way harder than anything that you would actually do. Um, so I'm trying to decide what's the best one for us to do right now. I don't think we need to do all of these. This one I think you could do pretty easily because we just did it with placeholders. We did it with placeholders. You can very easily do it without placeholders. Let's do, let's do this one. Let's do a cantilevered beam with a uniformly distributed load on it. We are going to do it starting with placeholders and then we will plug in the numbers after we've solved it. So I'm just calling this up for myself. Yeah, okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do it um, knowing the load, but we're gonna use the X cut as the placeholder. So kind of somewhere in between what we've done before. So this is the last one I'm going to do while recording. So this is beam 5. So we have a beam with a backspan that is 16 meters here and 3 meters here. We don't know what the reactions are, but we'll put some placeholders in here for ourselves. R1, R2, 0, 
and this is W equals 12 kilonewtons per meter. So this is the beam that we're going to solve. We're going to do part placeholder, part not placeholder. Basically, I'm going to cut at any spot X along its length, but we're going to solve this using our real numbers. So let's take a look. The very first thing we need to do is solve for our reactions. So this is the free body diagram. To solve for the reactions, an analogous point load would probably be helpful for us. So there's our beam reaction, reaction. And we're going to use an analogous point load. So it was 12 kilonewtons per meter, and we have 16 meters, or P equals 16 times 12, or 192. This is 16 meters. Oh, no, this value isn't right. This is 3 meters. P is actually 16 plus 3 times 12, or 228 kilonewtons. It is acting halfway along the entire length of the beam, or halfway in the middle of its load. So that was 16 plus 3 equals 19 divided by 2, 9.5 meters, 9.5 meters. Let's sum our moments about the z-axis, anything in that direction, being positive, and I'm going to sum it about R1. So R1 passes through the point, 0 passes through the point, my 228 kilonewtons spins it in that direction, so the negative direction, so minus 228 times 9.5 plus R2 times 16 equals 0. R2 equals 228 times 9.5 divided by 16 equals 135.4 kilonewtons. Um, you know what, I'm going to keep an extra decimal just so we don't lose anything. Uh, 228 times 9.5 divided by 16. Let's keep, let's keep 3, 8. Let's just keep 3, 8. Might as well. All right, let's sum our forces in the y direction. Everything upwards being 0. We've got R1 going upwards. We've got... 228 kilonewtons going down, and we've got R2 going upwards, which we know is 135.38. We can solve for R1, and we get R1 equals 92.62 kilonewtons. So we've solved for our reactions. Now, let's actually write them even in here for ourselves. This equals 92.62, and this equals 135.38. But now we want to know what the shear and moment is in this beam anywhere along its length. 
So let's do two cuts. Let's do it with x as a placeholder anywhere from 0 to 16, and then with x as a placeholder anywhere from uh, 16 to 19. So let's do it with x equals 0 to 16 meters. So we know that we have a reaction of 92.62 kilonewtons that equals 0. We know that we have a load of 12 kilonewtons per meter, but we're going to use the analogous point load to apply our load. This is x meters. We're making our cut x. And so p is our length times our load, or 12x. We want to know the internal shear and moment at these points. So we can sum the forces in the y direction with everything upwards being positive. We've got 92.62 kilonewtons going up. Well, let's write where this is happening. That's happening at 1 half x. And we've got 12x going downwards. So minus 12x minus our shear, or shear equals 92.62 minus 12x kilonewtons. Let's sum our moments about the z-axis, and I'm going to use point x, use that point right there. So my 92.62 kilonewtons is spinning in that direction, or the minus direction. So minus 92.62 times x, maybe I'll use a dot, times x. I've got 12x spinning it in that direction, or the positive direction, so plus 12x times 1 half x. V is passing right through it, so I'm left with m. m equals 92.62x minus 6x squared. So anywhere between reaction 1 and reaction 2, the shear is 92.62 minus 12x, and the moment is 92.62x minus 6x squared. Hmm, okay. Let's solve it for x equals 16 to 19 meters. So something interesting happens at this point. Let's solve for this on the other side of that interesting point. Let's draw our partial free body diagram. We have this reaction of 92.62, and we have this reaction, too, of 135.38. We do know that this is 16, actually, how do I want to do this? The way I did it last time. Ah. So we know that that's 16, and I am cutting it where this is x, so x is anywhere between 16 and 19, meaning that this distance is x minus 16. We have a uniformly distributed load on it of 12 kilonewtons per meter, but I want to use the analogous point load on this. 
So I have still 12x as my applied load, and it is being applied at 1 half x. So do we have all of our forces, all of our dimensions, and all of our reactions? The only thing we don't have is we know that for this thing not to be moving up and down or spinning around, there's internal forces keeping it in place. We want to know what that internal moment and what that internal shear are. All right, let's sum the forces in the y direction with everything upwards being zero. We've got 92.62 upwards plus 135.38 upwards, and we've got minus 12x downwards, and we've got minus v equals zero. So our shear equals 92.62 plus 135.38 equals 228 minus 12x. So we have our shear anywhere from 16 to 19. Now let's solve for our moment. So sum the moments in that direction being positive about the z-axis. I'm going to do it at cut x. So I'm putting my thumbtack right here. So I've got a thumbtack here and I'm pushing up with my 92.62 spinning in that direction or minus 92.62 and it is x away. I've got my 12x spinning in that direction so plus 12x. This is half x and this is half x. It's times half x away. I've also got my 135.38 spinning it in that direction, or the negative direction, minus 135.38 times this distance away, or x minus 16, plus my moment trying to spin it in that direction. Okay, let's clean this up a little bit. This one's busy. So we've still got minus 92.62x plus 6x squared minus 135.38x minus 130, well, no, a negative times a negative is a positive. So 135.38 times 16 equals 266 plus m equals 0. I want m equals, all of this is going to come to the other side. These two can add up. They'll be positive. So I've got 92.62 plus 135.38 equals 228x minus 6x squared minus 2,166. Kilonewton meters. So it looks like I have all of my equations now. This looks like a really hard problem, but it wasn't actually that hard when we do it kind of with x as our only placeholder. Let's figure out what some of these values are. Let's plug some of these in. I'm going to pick at, um, maybe I'll pick everywhere along its length. Maybe I'll pick each meter. No, maybe I'll do, you know what, do you know where I'm going to pick? I'm going to pick at uh, 2, 4, maybe, no, nah, maybe even less. I'll pick at 4, 8, 12 and 16, and I'll pick at 16, uh, 
17.5 and 19. Just to not lose our minds here. We'll pay attention to quadratic equations and everything like that. So let's solve for this at those points. So we know that um, for x equals 0 to 16, our shear is 92.62 minus 12x, and our moment is 92.62 minus 12x. So this is x, this is shear, this is moment. What? No, that's not right. Sorry, guys. Minus 6x squared. And then for x equals 16 to 19, our shear is 228 minus 12x, and our moment is 228x minus 6x squared minus 2,166. So let's check this at 0, 4, 8, 12, and 16. And maybe you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do 16, 17, 18, and 19. I changed my mind. I'm just going to do a couple extra little spots. Well, let's start plugging these in. This is just calculator work now. So between 0 and 16, I can use these equations. And between 19, 16 and 19, I can use these equations. I've kept a placeholder for 16 for doing both versions. All right, I'm going to... 92.62 minus 12 times 0. 92.62. I'm going to change that 0 to 4. I get 400, I get 44.62. I'm going to change that to 8. I get minus 3.38. So something's happened there. I've gone, I've switched over the line. Change that to 12. Minus 51.38 minus 16 minus 99.38. Okay, then I have to switch to my other equation. 228 minus 12 times 16. I get 36. So something big happened there. Let's plug it in at 17. Let's plug it in at 18. And let's plug it in at 19. Well, it makes sense that at 19 we shouldn't have any shear left. Because look, we have no reaction there. If there was force left there, it would have to go somewhere. All right, so we have a bunch of shear values that we've calculated. Let's do the same thing for moment. All right, we've got 92.62 minus... Oh, did I forget my x? Look at me. Wow, I am out of it today. Okay, when we calculated our moment, it was 92.62x minus 6x squared. I don't know what I was writing there. I rewrote shear. That's what I ended up doing. Okay, so 92.62x minus 6x squared. So we've got 92.62 times 0 minus 6 times 0 squared. Obviously, that's 0. Let's do it with 4. So 4 and 4 we get 274.5. Let's do it with 8. We get 356.96. Do it with 12. We get 274.5. Oh. We hit something there, and we seem to be coming back down. Let's do it with 16. Minus 54.1. 
We haven't had a negative moment. Let's take a look and see what that looks like when we draw it out. So now we have to switch equations. Now we have negative 2,166 2, plus 228 times 16 minus 6 times 16 squared. Oh, good. Minus 54. So it looks like right there at 16, we stay the same. There's no weird jump in moment. 17 minus 24. Let's do 18. We get minus 6. And let's do 19. 0. Perfect. Again, there's no reaction there. We'd have nowhere for that force to go. So let's draw these. I'm not going to draw, well, maybe I will redraw the free body diagram for us. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 17, 18, 19. I might as well even draw it to scale, right? Right. Uh, all right. Free body diagram, shear force diagram, and kilonewtons, and bending moment diagram, and kilonewton meters. That was 12 kilonewtons per meter. That is 92.62, and that is 135.38 kilonewtons, kilonewtons, and this is 16, and that is 3. All right, let's plot out our shear force. I want to make sure I kind of get a scale that looks about right. And we go up to about a positive 100 to minus 100. So I'm going to go right here. And then at 16, on this side of 16, it looks like I was down about 100. This was a linear equation. So this is 92.62, and this is 99.38, and then we shot up to 36, somewhere right to about there, and then we tapered back down to zero. So there is our shear force diagram. And let's take a look at our bending moment diagram now. It looks like we come up to about 356.96. So I'm going to call that one, two, three. And so that'll be my peak height. And that was at eight meters. So two, four, six, eight. Right about there. At four meters, two, four, I was at 274, 100, 200. And it was the same at 12 meters. Um, at 16 meters, I was minus 54.1. So that is 100. So we come down to about there. And then it looks like we tapered up to zero. So this was minus 54, and this was 356.96. All right, looking at this, we don't know if that's exactly the worst case. Maybe we should have checked on either side. Maybe we should have checked 7 and 9 
to see if it got worse or not, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to call it with this for right now. V max equals 99.4 kilonewtons and M max equals 356 or 357 kilonewton meters. There you go, guys. You know how to solve for the internal forces in any meme now. You have a real skill that people didn't figure out until um, the, the 1800s, essentially, that you can figure out internal forces all on your own. I'm going to bring this down so you can see. Um, so I'm going to make myself smaller here. Let's take a look. So here that is all worked out for you uh, again as well. There are a few other beams that have been worked out. Here's one with a point load anywhere along its length. That I also went and showed how you could calculate those values using one of the beam loading tables. So you have those beam loading tables available to you as well. This is the one we just did. And then here is one with a uniformly distributed load to part way and a point load on it. There's no beam loading table for this. There's a beam loading table for this, and there's a beam loading table for this. So this is one where it might be handy to instead use method of sections. And so that's what I did here for this. And look, you can see our bending moment diagram and our shear force diagram drawn out to scale here for you. So you can feel free if you are a person who likes lots of practice, there's those extra ones there that I didn't go through but with worked out steps so you can back check your work. There's also several more problems in the assignment, so uh, which isn't really an assignment. It's not something that's due, but again, if you like practicing lots of problems, it is there for you to try to just really get your head around it. I can tell you that most of the time we're going to be doing uniformly distributed loads with a simply supported beam, or those ones that are super common where we figured out that the reactions in the shear are WL divided by 2 and that the bending moment is WL squared divided by 8 at the midpoint. You should be able to draw that, you should recognize it, you should also be able to do it using method of sections because you're going to have to do it um, uh, in your project part two. But I'm not going to be evil. You're not going to have to do any of these hard ones like this in the exam. So I've given you options here. There's nothing being marked on those hard ones, but for people who really obsessively like to practice, and I know there are some of you, uh, you have several examples that you can work through now to practice with. So what are some things that we noticed, though? Shear tends to be worse at the ends, or where the reactions are, moment tends to be the worst at the middle or the farthest away from the reactions. Um, things to help you study. You should know how to do method of sections on a beam. You should know how to do method of sections with no numbers. Analogous point loads are not free body diagrams. Do not draw that as your free body diagram. You should know how to draw shear and bending moment diagrams. Don't forget to label and don't forget to put on units. You should know how to determine the worst shear and moment from those diagrams or by calculation. And you should be able to cross-check your shear force diagram, your bending moment diagram, your worst case shear and your worst case moment with beam loading tables. Now, if your uniformly distributed load was a factored uniformly distributed load or WF, that means the shear you find and the moment you find are MF and VF or the worst MF and VF. And remember, we want our actual member, our actual member to have a shear capacity and a moment capacity greater than the maximum factored shear and the maximum factored moment. But that is an exercise for next year when we go through this all in the winter term next year. And you should know how to look those up on the beam loading tables or find those equations on the beam loading tables. 
So I know it's a lot, but this is kind of really the culmination of everything we needed to learn for this term. Next week, we're going to look at um, another bending moment example, but it's one with, with a frame. You remember that brace frame we did with one diagonal element? Well, we're going to get rid of that diagonal element and moment connect the corners. And we're going to do what we just learned today to figure out what the reactions are and what the internal forces are all the way through that system. Um, we're going to talk about deflections, and then we're going to do a couple examples to kind of really get you ready for the exam and for your project. Like I said, I've been getting some questions about project part two. I'm going to wait to answer those, unless it's a really easy, obvious thing. Um, I'm going to wait to answer those until after we do that, because you will find almost all of those answers in next week's lecture. Um, okay, guys, uh, have a great week.